Right. Uh, keeping the uh, basic anatomical information that we acquired in the morning, let's take it one step forward and try identifying the variations in anatomy and the abnormalities as far as CT temporal is concerned. And again, let me reiterate that it is not going to be simply the problems or rather the pathologies which cause vertigo. I want you to go home with an overall view. I want to ignite a spark in you that you would like to read CT temporals on your own rather than just depending upon, depend upon your radiologists. And there's something I would tell you at the end of the presentation which should probably reinforce that fact in your minds. So let's get, go ahead with it. So, first, an anatomical variation. Look at the amount of pneumatization that can exist in a temporal bone. The amount of pneumatization that can exist in a temporal bone, normally we are used to use skiing sclerotic temporal bones, but here, the petrous apex, instead of having marrow, has air cells, and the extent of pneumatization extends anteriorly to the, into the zygomatic arch, and posteriorly almost up to the occipital bone. Right? So this is the kind of pneumatization that you might expect. That's another example. Look how the cochlea seems to be hanging in air over here. It seems as if the cochlea has no attachment but to the internal carotid artery. So that's another example. That's the, that's the uh, more magnified view. That's the vestibular aqueduct for you. A beautiful view of the vestibular aqueduct in a highly, highly pneumatized temporal bone. So, an, so one anatomical variation that you can encounter in routine practice is a highly pneumatized bone. And imagine this patient developing a cholesteatoma. You've had it trying to do a canal wall down mastoid exploration in this patient. Right? Again, pneumatization. Look at the petrous apex. Look at the more medial aspect of the te temporal bone uh, complex and see how big an air cell you have medial to the cochlea. Okay, next is what we again very frequently encounter is an anterior and dehiscent sigmoid. Remember from the scans in the morning, the sigmoid sinus had a plate co covering over it. This is not pathological. Why is this not pathological? Do we see any pathology in the mastoid? We don't. And yet we see that the lateral sinus is uncovered and it is anteriorly placed. So that's another anatomical variation that is an anterior and dehiscent sigmoid. Next comes in the jugular bulb, a high paced jugular bulb. The criteria for the jugular bulb to be high is that in the mesotympanum, it should extend to the promontory. If the jugular bulb, the upper limit of the jugular bulb extends up to the promontory, it is considered a high jugular bulb. So this is almost, this is the oval window, round window niche. And as you can see, the jugular bulb is extending up till here, whereas on the other side, I'm showing you the normal level of the jugular bulb. So there would always be a corresponding normal image or anatomical image for you on the right side. So that's a high riding jugular bulb. Not only is the jugular bulb high, as you can see, there is bone missing on top of the jugular bulb. So if you do, for, for example, actually what you find here is a, is a grommet in place. Imagine if I had gone a little inferior, I would not have known that this patient has a high jugular bulb, an uncovered jugular bulb, and inadvertently I might have opened up the jugular bulb. This, obviously this scan was done post myringotomy grommet because the patient was having some other issues. That's a sagittal scan. We couldn't cover the sagittal scans in the morning because the, the normal anatomy of the sagittal scans because of paucity of time. But anyways, that's a sagittal scan. On the left, again, this is the jugular bulb. And see, the jugular bulb is high riding and it's touching the grommet that I had inserted. Whereas on the other side, that's your normal jugular bulb. And before we go to the other slides, let me tell you, this is the classical incus malleus appearance of the molar tooth configuration that you see on sagittal scans. This is called the molar tooth configuration. It looks like the molar tooth that we have. So anteriorly is placed the head of the malleus along with the neck and the handle of the malleus and posteriorly the body along with the long process of the malleus. So that is the molar tooth configuration, normal jugular bulb, high riding, uncapped jugular bulb. Okay. Again, high riding jugular bulb, that's the normal jugular bulb. You can see the thin line, that's the tympanic membrane. Here, you see the jugular bulb becoming flat. Can you see a thin line here? That's because the jugular bulb is actually touching the medial surface of the tympanic membrane. So again, a high riding, uncovered jugular bulb. Be careful. It will always appear as a bluish 
semicircular, a dome-shaped hue in the, towards the lower part of the mesotympanum on otoscopy. Next, a dehiscent internal carotid artery. We saw the horizontal internal carotid artery in the morning on actual scans, the entire length, and we can very clearly see a thin plate of bone on top of it, whereas here you find the bone missing. So many times we've sort of scooped into the eustachian tube because it has granulation or cholesteatoma or for that matter some small polypoidal tissue. What happens if you have a, have a situation like this? You have a catastrophe on hands. So that is an, a dehiscent part of the internal carotid artery, the intratemporal uh, uh, aspect of the internal carotid artery. Now we move over to, over to the pathologies, right? And also, please do remember that I would not be covering any of the inner ear anomalies because I believe that itself is a vast subject. And since I don't do too much of cochlear implants, I'm not an authority on that as of now. So, ossicular discontinuity, again, the ri right side, sorry. Remember, what is this called? The what appearance? Ice cream cone appearance? Do we see the ice cream cone appearance over here? No. There is a huge gap between the head of the malleus and the body and the short process of the incus, correct? And how do we know it's pathological? We see that the entire mastoid antrum area or the periantral air cells at least are occupied by an iso-intense shadow, probably granulation, probably cholesteatoma, we don't know because CT doesn't help us differentiate that. So this is an ossicular discontinuity secondary to otitis media. Ossicular discontinuity again, on the other side, normal ossicle, but ossicular discontinuity again, but this is not because of otitis media. Can anyone say what is it because of? What's the other probable reason? Trauma, and where is the trauma? Can you see the fracture line there? Okay, so it's actually traumatic. It's actually traumatic. I had one more picture wherein there was a fracture line, a little anterior as well, but somehow I seem to have misplaced that picture. So ossicular discontinuity, second reason, is obviously traumatic. It could be induced by the surgeon as well. Right, now our friends from uh, Surat, they were uh, talking about the fact that we don't know, the report says that the facial nerve is intact, or rather is covered, and yet we find it bulging out dehiscent in uh, 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 while surgery. So how do you differentiate? You see this is the middle ear cavity, you have a soft tissue shadow here, which obviously means it's otitis media. That's the tympanic segment of the facial nerve and the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve. And very clearly we can see a rim of bone around the tympanic segment. Are we clear on that? Are we clear on that? Are we sleepy? So can I have a few yeses, please? Yes. yes. Okay. So that is chronic otitis media, but with an intact facial nerve. On the other hand, look at this. That's normal. What was this appearance called, friends? Morning, cochlea with the two parts of the facial nerve. Cobra head with snake eyes, right? So the cobra head snake eyes is here, but the cobra head snake eyes is here as well. And yet, can we see any rim of bone around this part of the facial nerve? So sir, your question gets answered, correct? So if you are missing this particular bone, that means that your facial nerve is dehiscent. And as it is right from the very beginning of our residency, we are taught, consider the facial nerve tympanic segment dehiscent unless you see it otherwise. So that's the dehiscent facial nerve. Not only that, that's the tegmen. Which, what tegmen is that, so, uh, uh, friends? What tegmen is that? What tegmen? Tympani, because we're seeing the ossicles. But are we seeing the tegmen here? So this is chronic otitis media, eroded tegmen, along with dehiscent facial nerve. Correct? Same page? Wonderful. Another example, this time, closer to the geniculate ganglion. This is the geniculate ganglion, right? This is not the facial nerve. This is tensor tympani, right? So this is the geniculate ganglion. This is the tegmen and uh, tympani. But we see that the geniculate, ga the, the soft tissue mass in the uh, attic is actually coming close to the geniculate ganglion. So another example of the facial nerve being dehiscent, more anteriorly closer to the geniculate ganglion, along with eroded tegmen, correct? along with the eroded tegmen. Now, lateral semicircular canal, keep this picture in mind because this big boss is again going to ask you to start imagining when he does all those funny maneuvers. So <laughs> that's the signet ring appearance of the lateral semicircular canal. And what do we see here? Is the bone missing? 
Is the bone missing? Is the bone missing? So this is this is lateral semicircular canal fistula. This was reported normal. So please read. There are four pathologies in this entire presentation which were reported normal. So please start reading your scans yourself. Please. Earnest request. Now, a fistula need not always be so blatant, so in your face. If you find that there is dimpling over the compact labyrinthine bone, please consider it to be fistulous as well. Som and Curtin very clearly says three contiguous scans less than one millimeter apart. If they show you a fistulous communication, then fistula is present. But if it's less than three contiguous scans, but in spite of that, if there is dimpling, please make sure that you keep a labyrinth lateral fistula in mind. And mind you, this is just a bony fistula. I'll show you an example of a labyrinthine fistula as well. And then we would probably have a better answer to Dr. Afgar, uh, Alfargal's question as to why some do not suffer from severe dizziness during the fistula test, and some do. So that's the opening over the lateral part of the lateral semicircular canal missing, whereas it's intact over here. So that's a lateral semicircular canal fistula. This too is a lateral semicircular canal fistula with, the, with only the dimpling. In fact, if you clearly try and follow the outline of the lateral canal, you'll see that somewhere here, the, lateral, uh, the outline of the canal is being breached. Now, that's a coronal view of the lateral semicircular canal fistula, we can very clearly see the bone covering the lateral semicircular canal, but do we see it here? No. We do, do we see a pathology here? Yes. This, what is this small point of bone here? Something we've missed, I mean, a lot of you could not answer in the morning, that small point of bone, that's the beginning. Which ossicle, which part of the ossicle we going from back to front? Short process of the incus. So that's the short process of the incus. I'll just recapitulate some of these anato uh, anatomical uh, considerations that we had uh, discussed in the morning so that it's just reinforced in your minds. So that's a lateral semicircular canal fistula. And can you see the facial nerve here? Because it's lying underneath the lateral semicircular canal. And are you very clearly able to see the, fistula, uh, the facial nerve here? You can see a kind of a trough there, correct? Now. What is believed is, I don't know what the scientific explanation is, this is the lateral semicircular canal, and this is how the facial nerve looks, correct? When we see it on a coronal scan. Now, if you look at, look at it on a coronal scan, because of paucity of time, we couldn't do the coronals as well as I would have liked to, to be done. The thing is that when, the, when you look at the coronal scans, there is a groove underneath the lateral semicircular canal, and the facial nerve resides in that groove. It is said very clearly in Valvasori that if you have a dehiscent facial nerve, the facial nerve comes out and the groove gets filled somehow. And so that groove is lost. So if you find the facial nerve underneath the lateral semicircular canal with the groove lost, consider the fact that your facial nerve might be dehiscent. Okay? Now, this is what explains the fistula test. This is a lateral canal fistula. Look, compare it to this one. Now, what is the intensity of the shadow inside the lateral semicircular canal on this scan? Hypo, hyper, iso. Louder, please. Iso, correct? Which is the normal appearance of the lateral canal. But how come we have a fistula here, but we have an, a hypo-intense shadow here and here? That's because air has entered into the membranous labyrinth. This is a pneumo labyrinth. Air has entered, the, not only has been the bony labyrinth breached, the membranous labyrinth has been breached, and air has entered inside, leading to a pneumo labyrinth. And these patients are more liable to give you a positive fistula sign rather than the ones with isolatedly a bony fistula. Are we clear on that? Okay? So this is a classical case of, the, of a lateral semicircular canal fistula with pneumolabyrinth. Now, 
We have various kinds of petrous bone cholesteatomas, right? Extending haywire, either supralabyrinthine or retrolabyrinthine or into the hypotympanum. So this is a case of a supralabyrinthine, of a, of a petrous bone cholesteatoma, PBC standing for petrous bone cholesteatoma, which extends above the labyrinthine and goes towards the petrous apex. So this is a supra, see, the superior semicircular canal is intact. It hasn't been touched. So it's gone over the superior semicircular canal and towards the petrous apex. So it's more liable to occur where? In one of those highly pneumatized mastoid bone scans that you saw earlier. So you might have a, an intact labyrinth, and yet behind the labyrinth, you could have extensive cholesteatoma, and that's why it's called petrous bone cholesteatoma. OK, again. The same scan on an actual uh, 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 section. So, uh, so this is petrous bone cholesteatoma extending towards the lateral, uh, towards the petrous apex. Now, petrous bone cholesteatoma. We've talked about uh, the semicircular canal fistula, rather the, the lateral semicircular canal fistula. Now we talk about a cochlear fistula. So, friends, what's again that that appearance? What appearance is that? Cochlear head, and if this is the cochlea, what are we seeing below? C4, carotid artery. But look at that particular scan. Loads and loads of cholesteatoma, and do you see an opening on the basal turn of the cochlea? So this is a case of petrous bone cholesteatoma with basal turn cochlea fistula, right? So this is a basal a cochlea fistula of petrous bone cholesteatoma, correct? Now. <clears throat> Oops, uh, I'm sorry, this slide actually should have come earlier. But then this is an aneurysm of the internal carotid artery. Over here, you see the entire horizontal internal carotid artery absolutely intact. But what you see here is connected to the internal carotid artery, there is an iso-intense shadow occupying the mesotympanum and the hypotympanum, and there is no covering, no bony covering. So this is an internal carotid artery an uh, aneurysm, which you would find as a reddish hue, somewhat similar to uh, glomus jugulare, on your otoscopic examination, the only difference would be it would not blanch on, pneumatic, uh, pneumas, uh, on segalization. This would not blanch by any means. And it would also show, so, uh, exhibit pulsation, correct? So that's another uh, the, uh, example of, that's the internal carotid artery over here. And you can see that that's the aneurysm of the internal carotid artery. I'm, I'm very sorry these slides should have actually come in later. And that is after the internal carotid artery has been uh, embolized using uh, Googly's wires. So that's post-embolization of uh, the, an aneurysm of the internal carotid artery. Right, going back to the rest of the pathologies, now we've more or less taken care of a lot of uh, the chronic otitis media. This is a case of meningoencephalic herniation bilateral in the same patient. Bilateral in the, in the same patient. That's the right, left side, that's the right side. As you can see, the tegmen is missing from both sides and part of the brain is herniating into the uh, attic region, correct? Why is it not chronic otitis media? Obviously, that is evident from the history, from the clinical examination, and the fact that the rest of the, mastoid, the, rest of the CT d does not show you any other abnormality like, uh, like some iso-intense shadows, either in the mastoid cavity, or for that matter, the rest of the middle ear cavity, the mesotympanum is absolutely free. So this is uh, meningoencephalic herniation, again, both, both, uh, both the sides simultaneously, contemporarily. So you can see the tegmen missing on both the sides with the brain herniating in, uh, downwards. Right. OK, let's take a look at some of the few facial nerve pathologies beyond the dehiscent facial nerve. Now, the, more co the commonest pathologies that one encounters in facial nerve within the temporal bone are the tumors of the facial nerve. And of the tumors, two are most common. One is a hemangioma, and the other is a neuroma. As far as hemangiomas are concerned, it's usually localized either at the geniculate ganglion or at the internal carotid artery because of the presence of the vascular plexus, whereas neuromas can occur anywhere, though you, they usually usually have a preponderance for the vertical segment and also for the genu of the, the second genu of the facial nerve. So this is a classical case. That's your normal facial nerve, right? That's the lateral canal, and that's the facial nerve hanging underneath the uh, lateral semicircular canal. That's the short process of incus. But can you see the facial nerve widened over here? Can you see the facial nerve? Just keep this, shadow, this, this iso-intense shadow in mind. This is a neuroma. 
right? This is a neuroma, and how can you, how can you uh, ascertain that from a CT scan? I'll let you know in a minute. So again, that's a mastoid segment of the facial nerve. That's a mastoid segment of the facial nerve, but we see it's become widened. And the ISO intensity is uniform. So this goes more in favor of a neuroma. Why is this differentiation important? That too, I would let you know. But now, let's look at the fact that there is a tumor at the geniculate ganglion area. That's the geniculate ganglion with the superior petro, uh, GSPN and the labyrinthine segment. And can you see this entire area occupied by iso-intense iso shadow? But what else do you see? Compare it to this shadow. This is iso-intense, but this is speckled. This is speckled. So this is the classical salt and pepper appearance of a geniculate ganglion hemangioma. Right? It, because it arises from the, va uh, from the vascular plexus that exists around the geniculate ganglion. So it's not from the facial nerve per se, whereas the neuroma arises from the facial nerve per se, the body of the facial nerve. Why is this important? It's important because post-surgery, because this is arising from the vascular plexus, it is, easily, it is possible for us doing very gentle surgery to peel off the hemangioma from the body of the facial nerve and give the patient a good facial nerve result three months down the line post-surgery. But a neuroma is a neuroma is a neuroma. You have to do a resection of the facial nerve and an end-to-end -end anastomosis or a, sur a nerve graft. So no way are you going to give the patient a result better than facial nerve, House Brackman 4 or 5 for that matter. So that is why differentiating a facial nerve tumor from a neuroma to a hem hemangioma is extremely important. The other thing is a neuroma, when the patient presents with a the facial nerve, they recover, but they recover partially. They have multiple attacks. A facial patient with a geniculate ganglion, ganglion hemangioma has facial, nerve tumor, uh, has facial nerve palsy, which recovers completely and keeps on having multiple episodes, unless and until the episodes become so many that the facial nerve starts undergoing fibrosis because of compression. Right? Again, same geniculate ganglion hemangioma, geniculate ganglion area, and that's the tumor in the geniculate ganglion area with that speckled or salt and pepper appearance. Everyone wide awake, that gentleman there is, speak, uh, is sleeping, does he need to be woken up? No, not a problem. Okay, so this is what a geniculate ganglion tumor would appear on an MRI. Correct, the geniculate ganglion. Remember, there is no roof, no bony roof on, a geni on the geniculate ganglion. If you remember, of, recollect our anatomies, the geniculate ganglion actually lies on the roof of the temporal bone and it is covered by the dura itself. There is no canal for the geniculate ganglion as such. So this is uh, the same patient. That's the geniculate ganglion area. That's the geniculate ganglion area. And that's the tumor arising from the geniculate ganglion area of the facial nerve. Correct? Another example of a geniculate ganglion tumor, this one had the salt and pepper appearance, the speckled appearance, much better, and that's the reason I decided to put in cobra heads, snake eyes, blah, 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 blah. The geniculate ganglion is not seen here, but you can see this elevation here. But besides that, besides that, I don't drink but a glass of whiskey to anyone who tells me what else is wrong here. Fast, fast, running out of time. Please, come on. Anyone, take a shot, yeah? I'm not going to shoot you. I'm not going to, look at the cochlea. Is there a fistula there? All my drying of the throat has gone to waste. Is there a fistula here? So this is a, gen because the geniculate ganglion is right on top of the basal turn of the cochlea, so if you let it, uh, let it grow and grow and grow, there is a possibility that it can lead to a cochlear fistula, right? Then that, the, obviously, this patient will start presenting with sensorineural or perceptive deafness as well. Okay. <clears throat> this is another hemangioma, and it is considered under the top, the, the, uh, the description of a facial nerve hemangioma, though it does not arise from the facial nerve, right? So facial nerve hemangiomas can either be at the geniculate ganglion or in the internal, carotid, in internal auditory canal. This is a hemangioma because, why? Because there is no contrast administered and yet it is hyperintense in shadow, right? So this actually arises from the scarpa's ganglion. 
Why am I paying, uh, again, stressing on this fact is this arises from the scarpa's ganglion and not from the facial nerve. That's why a lot of uh, uh, sort of academicians, they st have started considering facial nerve hemangiomas as intratemporal, they st have started, uh, they use the nomenclature intratemporal hemangiomas rather than facial nerve hemangiomas. Since this arises from the scarpa's ganglion, it gives rise to fluctuating facial nerve paralysis because the facial nerve is pretty close to it as well as sensory neural hearing loss right from the very beginning unlike a geniculate ganglion hemangioma. So this too is considered under the heading of a facial nerve hemangioma though it actually arises from the scarpa's ganglion in the internal auditory canal. Next is congenital cholesteroma. How do we know? Can you see the intact tympanic membrane? Yes, no. Right? Can you see the in intact tympanic membrane? Right? Can you see the intact tympanic membrane? And there is this iso-intense shadow. Again, the rest is clinical. Patient has never had a discharge of history. Correct? The patient is complaining of, uh, uh, of a conductive hearing loss. And you find this whitish milky structure right behind the tympani intact tympanic membrane. And that is when you do the scan and you realize that it's a case of a congenital cholesteatoma. Okay. Uh, moving further down, Glomus, do I really need to talk about it? Not at least about glomus jugulare. I mean, all of you must have seen a large number of cases. But anyways, that's the normal glomus, uh, normal jugular bulb. But as we can see on both sides, the jugular bulb over here is occupied by a large hyper-intense shadow with speckled appearance and a lot of bony destruction, right? So that's the classical case of uh, glomus jugulare. Now, there's one uh, very important, very interesting thing that I would like to point out. A lot of times when there is this shadow in the mastoid, right, people consider that the jugulare has spread into the mastoid as well. Well, yes, that is possible. But what also is possible is that the glomus is obstructing the eustachian tube and this is a secondary or a reactionary effusion. How do you differentiate? Very simple. Effusion will not cause the trabeculations to get eroded. So if you have a glomus jugulare, if you have iso-intense shadows in the mastoid cortex, in the mastoid bone, yet the trabeculations are maintained, then it's probably a case of secondary effusion rather than the glomus extending into the mastoid, right? Why is it important? Helps you plan your surgery. What else? Now, this is typical glomus tympanicum type A. Glomus tympanicum type A arises from the parasympathetic plexus around the Jacobson's nerve. That's the promontory for you. Yes, no? Yes, that's the promontory. Can we faintly see the basal turn of the cochlea? Can you see the tympanic membrane? And can you see the tympanic membrane splattered onto the tumor inside? Again, how do you know it's glomus? Because it's red in color when you do an otoscopy, right? It blanches. What other, po other possibility could it have been? A congenital cholesteatoma, which would not have been red in color. So this is a glomus tympanicum, correct? This is again a glomus tympanicum, a slight, a little lower down, right? Glomus temp, uh, uh, tympanicum, a little lower down, close to the hypotympanum. And say, so again, the same glomus tympanicum shown here as this hyperintense shadow on an MRI. And can you very clearly now see the communication of the glomus with the vascular, uh, with the vessels over there? Is it clear here? Can you see this uh, small mass, finger uh, pseudopodia kind of a protrusion? That's the glomus com uh, communicating with the internal jugular vein or the jugular bulb. Okay, what other tumors can we f uh, face as far as the uh, jugular foramen is concerned? What is there in the jugular foramen? The rest of the cranial nerves, the 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th. So you can always have a schwannoma of the jugular foramen. What schwannoma, which nerve is it arising from, obviously depends upon what is the symptomatology of the patient. And then, having said that, it could always arise from the 9th, but because the area is a very compact, constricted, rigid area, there's no area, there's no space for expansion other than towards the cranium, intracranium. So it can always cause compression of the 9th and the 10th. 10th uh, uh, and the 11th, and therefore give rise to symptoms pertaining to all the three cr lower cranial nerves. Obviously, 12th is much later because it has a separate canal of its own. It goes into the hypoglossal canal. So that's a huge glomus jugular, uh, uh, jugular foramen tumor, a schwannoma on the left side, whereas the right side ju uh, jugular foramen is absolutely normal. Same jugular foramen schwannoma being shown on a coronal scan. 
jugular foramen on the right side absolutely normal, jugular foramen on the left side occupied by a large tumor. What is this, friends? Not the arrow. Don't tell me that's a black arrow. I know that. But behind the arrow, what are we seeing? What's that? Facial nerve. Absolutely. Which segment? Vertical segment, because we're looking at a coronal scan and we're seeing the facial nerve in its entirety. The rest of the Atlanto actual joints and whatnot. Now, one of my favorite signs. This is called the double cochlear sign, and it is a classical appearance of otospongiosis. So, that's the cochlea, the three turns, cobra head, snake eyes. That's your actual cochlea, but this is the spongiotic bone. This is the spongiotic bone. So because it goes round the cochlea, it gives the impression as if the patient has a double cochlea. It has more than two and a half turns. So this is what, would, what you would get in advanced cases of otospongiosis, otosclerosis. That is the double cochlea sign. That's the same uh, patient on an actual view. That's the actual cochlea, the basal turn, the middle turn, and the apical turn. Can you see the, uh, the de demineralization around the cochlea? Yes, no. Yeah? Hello? Good morning. Yeah? Good morning. Can I have a good morning back from you? Thank you. So that's, uh, that's the demineralization around the cochlea, which is uh, classical of otospongiosis. Again, contemporary otospongiosis we know is, can be a bilateral disease. So otospongiosis, both sides, with the, with the double cochlea sign. Correct? Now, this is called the glowing cochlea sign and it is pathognomonic of fibro-osseous dysplasia. So what do you see? You don't only pay attention to what is happening around the cochlea. You see the cochlea lighted up, like, right? Lighted up like the lighting we saw yesterday. You know, it's like Mysore city right now, but we also see that the cortical bones are expanding. The cortical bones are expanding. So this is a classical case of fibrous osseous dysplasia. Still remember my professor's words very clearly. Short textbook of surgery, Bailey and Love. One statement patient tells you over the phone, and you know it's fibrous osseous dysplasia. Doc, my hat size seems to be changing too frequently. So that means he is, his, his, the bones over here are expanding, and he's unable to wear the same hat. So this probably, that probably tells you that the patient is having fibrosis dysplasia. Anyway, that had nothing to do with this. So that's another uh, slide of the same patient. As you can see, the <coughs> ossification, that, uh, the extraneous ossification that occurs seems to follow the entire vestibule, or rather the entire labyrinth, instead of just following the cochlea. So not only is the cochlea lighted up, the semicircular canals are lighted up as well. Same. Cochlea lighted up. The, what, what canal is that, friends? Fast. Actual scan. What canal is that? We are looking at the, base, the turns of the cochlea. So what canal, what part is that? Come on, come on. Make me feel that I, you've learned something today. Posterior canal. So if this is the posterior canal, what is this? Vestibular aqueduct. Perfect. So we can see hyperintensity around the posterior uh, canal. We can see hyperintensity around the vestibule. We can see hyperintensity around the cochlea, and obviously thickening of the cortical bone. Widened IAC. Does it always mean a vestibular schwannoma? Big question. So that's a normal IAC. That's a widened IAC. I kept on telling, say, insisting upon something in the morning. Look at the lip. Not of your girlfriend, not of your wife, of the internal auditory canal, the porous. Acute angle anteriorly, obtuse angle posteriorly, correct? So if you find, see, the acute angulation doesn't matter too much. It's the, op uh, so the obtuse angulation doesn't matter too much. It is the acute angulation which starts getting eroded. So if that starts getting eroded, your antenna should be raised. But then, having said that, I really don't know why would, we, I, why would I want to do a CT in a patient where I'm suspecting a vestibular schwannoma. I would rather straight away go in for an MRI 3 Tesla with GAD, like I had mentioned uh, during my presentation last year. Same widened, wi uh, vestibular, uh, widened internal auditory canal. OK, so what's the situation of the internal, uh, internal auditory canal here? Is it widened? Sure? Absolutely? Yes? No? Is the IAC widened here either at the porous or otherwise? Come on, it's very simple. 
Yes, no. Yes, no. Okay, yes, show of hands, please. Okay, no show of hands. Do I need to say anything else? Q E D. So, this is this. I will actually not discuss this slide any further. <laughs> okay, some of the other tumors that we might encounter in the CP angle, a meningioma, how do you differentiate it from a vestibular schwannoma? Look at the vestibular schwannoma, look at its contour, it's more rounded, right? With a small peg if it is extending into the internal artery canal. But if you look at the meningioma, it's kind of a, it's a semicircle, but the important part are those two yellow arrows. Because it arises from the meninges, it's smattered to the posterior face of the petrus. And so it has to have one flat surface. And that's called the dural tail sign. This is the dural tail. Because it arises from the meninges, there is hypervascularity around the tumor, along the dura attachment, along the posterior face of the petrus bone. So a dural tail sign and a flat edge like this goes in favor of meningioma, whereas something like this goes in favor of a vestibular schwannoma, correct? In inside, in, within the vestibular schwannoma, if you find it to be heterogeneous, right, hyperintense, isointense, is uh, and hypointense, then that means that there has been hemorrhagic percolation within the uh, vestibular schwannoma, and that's a hemorrhagic vestibular schwannoma. Okay. This is, there's a tumor here. There's this tumor extending into the basal turn of the cochlea. And there's a tumor here into the vestibule. This patient had a normal plain MR. Who would have been responsible if you hadn't asked for the gadolinium? So this patient had normally, what are we taught about vestibular schwannomas? That the T2 acts like a pseudo-contrast. The T2 images act like a pseudo-contrast because the CSF is hyper-intense. The schwannoma appears iso or hypo-intense. And therefore, it starts showing up on T2. This one did not. This one did not. Till the GAD was administered. So MRI, 3 Tesla, now probably 7 Tesla will come into the picture, doesn't matter. GAD is a must. Small intracanalicular vestibular schwannoma. I'll talk about uh, details uh, regarding this patient on Sunday when we talk about red flags in vertigo. But then, again, small vestibular schwannoma more towards the fundus. In fact, it is at the fundus. Can you see the geniculate ganglion there? Yeah? Can you see the geniculate ganglion there? So that's the internal auditory canal over here, and that's the small tumor over there. So why is the geniculate ganglion hyperintense, friends? What's the explanation? Simple. There is a tumor, there is stasis, and if there is stasis, there can be hyperintensity, correct? Okay. Again, I'll be talking in details about this patient uh, on Sunday, red flags in vertigo. But what area was this? Sorry? Louder. So if there is something here, what does it make it? It's written for you. It's an endolymphatic sac tumor, a locally malignant adenocarcinoma. So you can see this area normal, but can you see the erosion here? Right? This is an endolymphatic sac tumor. As, as, as I said, I'll talk about uh, talk more in details about this particular patient as well when uh, we speak, uh, we, when we discuss red flags in vertigo on Sunday. Just another uh, scan of the same patient. See how locally invasive this tumor can be. And when you listen to the presentation, you would get flabbergasted. Some of you who were there in Vizac probably would have heard about it last year as well. So that's an endolymphatic sac tumor. We talked about the fact that uh, in the morning that if there are air cells in the petrous apex, it can be occupied by a pathology. So that's, an, that's a petrous apex cholesterol granuloma. 
and it can always give rise to Guillain-Barré syndrome. It can always give rise to uh, abducens nerve palsy because the Dorello's canal, which houses the abducens nerve, passes right at the petrous apex. Anyway, we won't discuss the Dorello's canal here, but this is an example of a petrous apex cholesterol granuloma. Same patient, actual scan, uh, coronal scan. Those are the turns of the cochlea. What's that, friends? Sorry, carotid artery. Everyone's very, very sleepy. So that's uh, Peter Sipek's uh, cholesterol granuloma. I do not have the courage, like boss here, to ask you to stand up because he's a much bigger boss. You won't stand up if I ask you to. So <clears throat> now, just a few slides left. So we have some other tumors which might involve the Peter's apex or the clivus or the petro uh, sphenoid synchondrosis. What are the usual tumors? You can have a chondrosarcoma, you can have a chondroblastoma, and you can have a chordoma. Now, chordomas are usually the uh, uh, tumors arising from the notochordal remnants that are there in the clivus. So the more towards the midline because the clivus is more towards the midline. Whereas chondro, because it's, it has to arise from cartilaginous cell rests, they can either arise from the synchondrosis because it has cartilage where the petrous apex meets the sphenoid and the basi occiput at that clivus, or it can even arise from the cartilage of the glenoid fossa. So that's, th that's the differentiating feature besides the other uh, features like the radiological presentation and the fact uh, that it will have different, uh, sorry, clinical presentation and different radiological appearances. But if the tumor is more towards the midline, consider a chordoma. If it's a little more laterally placed, consider it to be a chondro chondroblastoma or a chondrosarcoma. So... <clears throat> This is where we find that there is erosion. It's much more clearer here. So you can see that the, the, the bone lines are absolutely well maintained here, the bony outline, but there is something op occupying this area with this calcification in between the uh, uh, space occupying lesion. So that's a chondrosarcoma. That's again the same patient, a lower down view. Chondroblastoma, as I said, ten, can also arise from the uh, cartilage arising in, I mean, residing in the glenoid fossa. So this, as, uh, this can give you an idea as to what I was talking about. That's a chondroblastoma coming out of the glenoid fossa, chondroblastoma, and obviously extending into the infratemporal fossa, right? Uh, chondroblastoma again, chondroblastoma again. So chordoma, as I said, that's the chordoma. It's a little more. I think, yeah, it's a little more towards the midline, the chordoma, whereas the chondromas were more over, more, a little more laterally. Thank you very much. I seem to have finished two and a half minutes in advance. <laughs>